Welcome to episode 314 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Jameson Parker, who is a development executive at Bright Light Picture and also a producer who's done several films. We talk about how he and his company find scripts and why and how those scripts make it into production. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, Please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episode number 314. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and career letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I'm working on. I'm putting together the Kickstarter video for the Rideshare Killer this week. I'm making good progress and we're hoping to launch the campaign on February 3rd, Monday, February 3rd. So that's actually the same day that this episode is published. I, since we've shot the entire film, I use a good bit of the footage in the Kickstarter video, and at the end, we have a short teaser trailer. So if you're interested in seeing the video or learning more about the project, or perhaps even contributing, just go to therideshakiller.com, and that will actually take you to the Kickstarter page. Again, that's therideshakiller.com. Any help you can give us is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't just have to be monetary help either. If you're not in a position to contribute, no worries at all, but perhaps pass along the a link to all of your horror fan friends. Aside from raising money, the whole point to the Kickstarter campaign is to raise awareness for the film, so anyone you can mention it to is a big help and greatly appreciated. Anyways, wish us luck. Hopefully we'll be able to raise the money and get through post-production easily. So that's the main thing I'm working on this week. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing producer Jameson Parker. Here is the interview. Welcome, Jameson, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you so much for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Yeah, totally. Um, I grew up in a very small town in British Columbia, Canada uh, called Shawnigan Lake. It's about 45 minutes north of the, the capital of the province, uh, Victoria. Um, I, I've been interested in the entertainment industry for almost my entire life. I started as an actor. Um, you know, my dad uh, weaned my brother and I on old westerns and uh, Turner Classic movies and hmm. episodes of the Rockford Files and and this weird, uncanny knowledge about the industry. So. Um, I started as an actor. I went to theater school. And just just to step in there for a second, so was your dad in the business or he just was a real movie fan, just a fan you know, of television yeah, movies? Yeah, just a big fan of movies and TV. And so, um, yeah, n not connected to the business at all. Neither of my parents were. Um, but we're both super supportive. Mm -hmm. When I wanted to pursue a career as an actor, I went to school for it. The only thing that they asked was that when I did my training, it was somewhere that also gave me a degree. And that was kind of their, you know, backup plan. If if he never gets if he never gets any work, at least he's got a degree. Um, I worked for a while, uh, a few years as a professional theater actor across Canada, like working at every every pretty much every major regional theater in the country, uh, making next to no money in mm -hmm. in professional theater in Canada, but. Um, but it was invaluable experience and something that um, I draw on every day now as a producer. Um, I got into this side of the business because I, you know, I directed music videos through college and um, little sketches for college humor and some of this digital content 
and produced some music videos and had been in a play um, that I really loved called Prodigals. And that was the first feature that I made with um, with my then uh, business partner, David Kay. And uh, and we were like, well, we want to make – let's make a foolish – like let's jump in and make a feature film and see if we can do it. Um, mm-hmm. And we did. And from there, I just kind of caught the bug. It was really, you know, the transition was to make work for ourselves as actors. David and I had gone through the, the BFA theater program at UBC together. So it was to make it was to make work uh, for ourselves as actors. And, yeah. and then that kind of turned into me sliding more into the producing than the acting. And um and that's when I linked up with with Sean Williamson and Brightlight, which is I where see, I am now. Okay, perfect, perfect. So let's talk. What? Tell me a little bit about Brightlight. What sort of films do you guys do over there? Yeah, uh, Brightlight's been around for, was uh, for for a long time. It was uh, first announced at TIFF in two thousand and one. Um, we've done stuff like you know we've done indie films like Colossal and White Noise and Fifty Fifty. Uh, you know some bigger stuff for the American studios like The Interview, um, Horns, The Ninth Life of Louis Drax is a movie that the company put together. Mm -hmm. Um, We've had TIFF galas and premiered at Sundance and kind of all over the world, shot all over the world, uh, based in Vancouver. um, And we also do a glut of television as well. We're currently producing The Good Doctor for Sony and ABC. Okay, got to. Yeah, I noticed too, Descendants 3, I think, was listed on your website too. So that's yeah. pretty, yeah, middle of the road. Yeah, pretty high end, middle of the road type content. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's all great. Um, so let's just talk about indie film. Obviously, something something like The Descendants comes from Disney. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a different bird than independent film. But let's talk a little bit about indie, indie film in general. Yeah. What are some of the trends that you're seeing and where do you think some of these trends are going? Oh, um, well, (laughs) it's getting increasingly hard to make an independent film, but it's also, um, you know, there, there is a, there is a slow death of an old kind of sales model and this resurgence or of a, a similar model, I guess, to, to the studio system where a lot of these, um, streamers are the ones who are getting behind, these films uh and then there's you know then there's places like neon and a24 and and a few indie distributors that are still left in la who are who are making things and making interesting stuff um i mean big beach has had a huge year this year um obviously a24 um and there are some of those bigger kind of indie brands um we're lucky we're a canadian company so we we don't seek out Canadian content. If things happen to be Canadian content, then um, we can put it through Telefilm, which is our national film funding body, and mm-hmm. and draw some money out of there to you know make a movie that would maybe normally be made for four or five million for seven or eight. Um, so that's a kind of cool model that we are you know, fortunate enough to tap into. Yeah. And let me, let me just back you up a little bit. So you mentioned that there was this old sales model that was starting to crumble. What is the old sales model that you're referring to specifically? I mean, with indie films, it seems like the old sales model was always just, you know, raising money and that doesn't seem that different than it is now. Um, uh, well, <clears throat> I mean, we're talking about a, sale, a model that is based on pre-selling your film into certain territories or, mm-hmm you know, approaching a sales agent or bringing a sales agent on board who is um, capable enough to put up a minimum guarantee for your film against the world and putting that as part of your finance plan. But it's getting increasingly harder and harder to sell um, some of these independent films uh, into some of these foreign territories. Mm-hmm. Um and then it's even harder to pre-sell them. Um, people are waiting more, taking less risk um, because a lot of the um, exhibitors in these certain territories are uh, not seeing the ticket sales that they used to. Um, 
people are staying home to watch Netflix and they're coming out for big event films rather than more niche fare. Now, you know, I think that something like a movie like Uncut Gems having such a huge uh, box office in the U.S. is very encouraging. You know, people are getting out to see some of these um, – you know, really independent films, um, some of these more original scripts mm-hmm. and, um, you know, knives out, obviously a big, bigger version of that, but that is a non Marvel, non tentpole movie that made a ton of money at the box office, which is encouraging to mm-hmm. say the least. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of the pre-sales and, and, um, getting those pre-sale deals set up, what is the thing nowadays that's, that's the winners from the losers? Like what do you need to um, actually do some pre-sales in, in current, the current market? Uh, well, sales are still largely cast based. Um, I mean, the basis of everything is a great script. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, we look, we look more to, um, independent financiers rather than a sales model, you know, somebody that we can partner with who has a good creative head on their shoulders and knows how to spend their money wisely um, and can be a partner in the development of the creative so they feel comfortable putting money into the project um, rather than going out and trying to pre-sell a film Um you know, we're not, uh, Bright Light's not a massive company. We aren't, um, uh, we don't, ha- I guess we don't have access to those, you know, those big stars that sell in some of those international territories like the Nicolas Cages and the Russell Crowe's and some, some of these people, these names that you see floating around AFM and CAN all the time attached to these packages. Johnny Depp is becoming one of those increasingly to get something of quality made, you're needing to find smart partners who believe in what you're doing and aren't necessarily running, uh, your, your, I guess, movie through a sales metric to see how much it would generate in Germany or France or the UK. Rather, they're betting on smart creatives and great material. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this just from a screenwriter's perspective. What is some advice you you would have for, you know, indie screenwriters? There's screenwriters that maybe want to get into this this space. Um, What does a screenplay look like for these indie films? Are there any tips or tricks that you could um, give to our audience on that front? I don't think there's no like, there's no tricks to doing it. It's just but in terms of like budget, like are there certain budget ranges that you're saying these indie films, um, you know, you just mentioned a guy like Nicolas Cage. I mean, there's going to be certain budget, even with a, with a star like Nicolas Cage. I mean, we're talking, probably talking about, you know, less than nowadays, less than 10 million, less than 5 million. There's probably budget restrictions. There probably are some things that screenwriters would want to be aware of um, if they think that they're going to work in this space. I, I just say write something good. Don't worry about what the budget is. Just find something. What, however big it is, write the write it as best as you can. The mm-hmm. rest of it will fall into place. The right amount of money will come for a great script. It will find a home if it's good enough. Just mm-hmm. yeah, I would say um, write something that's compelling with characters that we want to spend an hour and a half to two hours and fifteen minutes with. Um, and with twists and turns that are going to make your audience um, excited and titillated throughout the ride. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I would say 90% of my audience is very confident that they've written that script. So then the next step is how do they find indie producers like yourself? And maybe we can just start with specifics, like how do projects come through your company and then maybe even take a step back and give us some more just general advice. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I think look at what are you watching, you know, when you are, if you think that you've written the screenplay, what are you watching? What, what movies do you, um, have you seen in the past two or three years, um, that you loved? Mm-hmm. I think of something, um, like searching. Seb Ohanian is a really, um, phenomenal 
a young producer who has made a really nice name for himself in this space. Another guy like that is Ross Putman, who's now an agent at Verve. These guys who have great taste um, have a growing Rolodex and a little bit of success behind them so that they can um, push something forward that they're they're in love with. So mm-hmm. find who's taste aligns with yours and if you've written something that is personal enough and something that you want to see on screen then chances are the stuff that you like uh, the producers of those films will respond to your material um, if your tastes are as aligned as as they should be um, and and as far as like how material comes through bright light through a multitude of avenues, whether it's, you know, friends of friends sending me screenplays or whether it's uh, agents or managers or um, sometimes cold submissions. Uh, you know, it's always better, I think, when a script comes to us with some sort of personal connection. There's a it's all storytelling, right? Everything is. And the pitch process is no different. There's some story behind it. It's like, why do I want to pick up this screenplay on Sunday at four o'clock um, when I could be spending time with friends or family? Why am I excited to sit down for two hours and read your script? That there, you know, sometimes there's a um, there's a story that comes along with it. This came to me through this person and they're super excited about it and they think that it's going to be the next blah. Um, and that always helps for sure. Having some kind of personal connection to it, have something, mm-hmm. some kind of story to it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the specific projects that you've worked on. You um, mentioned prodigals. Let's talk um, briefly about summer of 84. Um, yeah. How did you get involved with that project? Uh, <laughs> Summer of 84 was a script that I, I found, um, I met the writer, Matt Leslie, um, at a kind of junior executive networking event that happens annually, sometimes twice a year, um, in LA called the Little Black Book event. And I was leaving... He was showing up with a buddy. I was down there with um, a, f- a friend and colleague at um, Lighthouse, our sister company here in Vancouver, Bright Light Sister Company. And uh, our two, you know, our two friends were stopped to say hello and 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 goodbye and get have a quick catch up. And while they were chatting, Matt and I struck up a conversation. And he told me about Summer of '84 and asked if he could send the package and the script and I said absolutely and I looked at this pitch deck that he had put together at that point um, our KSS were on board and I had seen and loved Turbo Kid and so that was a that was also a big you know it was a big piece for me going oh these are really kind of cool Canadian filmmakers there's a nice angle there Um, so I looked at the package and it was unreal it was so cool I couldn't wait to read the script and so, so I um, I dug in immediately, and, and maybe it took me about des- two. Or three- and maybe you can describe that package a little bit. Like you say, it's so cool. What was the package? What was actually in the package? Is it like a, um, you know, a PowerPoint presentation? Is it just a written word document with pictures and and sort of a description? What was their package exactly? This thing was like it. It was full blown. It, it's it's a. It was a PDF document that was sort of a visual representation of the film, you know, with the kind of classic, there was a mood board of, of images from films that they, um, that RKSS wanted to reference in the making of the film, um, you know, a breakdown of all the characters in it, uh, a quick summary. It was just something to wet, wet your palate and, it was a great tool as we went, it was something that our KSS put together and that they do all the time. Um, I'm working on another movie with them now that goes to camera in the summer and they do it for all of their films. And it's, yeah, it is, it's, it's just a visual representation of, um, of the movie that they want to make. And they are filmmakers who are great at creating 
fun. They're, they're such a joy to work with and such great, generous people that you, it's infectious. Their mm-hmm. energy around making movies is infectious. I got you. Now, so when you're meeting this um, this guy at this event, this networking event, is he one of um, RKSS? Is he part of that trio? No, Matt had just Matt had written the script with his writing partner Stephen Smith. Um, through a series of happenstance, he had met RKSS and pitched it to them, and they had loved it and and were around the project, and then. Nice, um, nice. I chased Matt for the rights to the screenplay for probably two or three months until he relented and <laughs> gave them to me. Huh. Um, and then uh, Matt ended up Matt, Matt ended up being a producer on the project. So we uh, we took it to myself and Sean uh, with Matt took it to Gunpowder and Sky, who had uh, who had read the script. They were a newly formed company at the time. Uh, Cody Zwig, who is an exec uh, over at Gunpowder and Sky, had just moved over, um, and he had he had read the script at his previous job. There was no nothing for that company to do with the with the project; they couldn't finance. But as soon as Cody left and got to Gunpowder, he championed it at the studio, and um, and was ultimately a, a huge part of why we got it made. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, and this is, I'm just curious, so when you when he's pitching the project to you um, and you were familiar with RKSS, how much does that play into the decision? You know, you had a director's, uh, in this case, a directing trio that you liked, um, but how much does that impact? Like, you obviously you like the script too, but how much does that impact in terms of you jumping on board and getting involved, just having more of a complete package than, say, just a screenplay that you liked? Um. I mean, in this particular instance, yeah, absolutely, it, it made a difference. I think that it really depends on who those, who that director is or what that package is. Things have come to us way over-packaged with pieces that um, uh, I guess we don't, don't necessarily get us as excited as, say, an RKSS package. Mm-hmm. For this one, it was like there was a – they had a great pitch for the film. Generally, I like just having a screenplay hmm. fall in my life. There was much of a package on Summer of 84 because there was no cast involved oh, before Green Light. There was, it was really just a director and a script. Um, and just but tu- yeah, it helped. For sure. Yeah, and just touch on that a little bit, um, where you say sometimes projects come that are overpackaged. Um, what does that actually mean? And maybe give a little bit of examples, because I run into that a lot with with screenwriters approaching me. They say, "Oh, I'm going to get this such and such a director attached," and it's a director I never heard of. And so that's always my thing. It's like I don't know that that's going to help your chances. I think that could actually hurt your chances. Attaching cast that has no sales value seems like overpackaging. But maybe you can give us some sort of real world examples of what you mean by overpackaging. I mean, no, you're totally right. It's like, okay, you're going to bring it. If somebody's going to bring you a package with two or three actors and a director that you've never heard of, then why are you doing that? Why are you bringing that director on? Why are you bringing those cast on? And if the reason is, oh, because they're friends of mine and I know them and, you know, sometimes they're a semi-recognizable name or have recognizable credits, but like you say, no, sales value then you you've put obstacles in the way you know unless it's like it it really depends because sometimes people go oh i'm friends with uh i don't know somebody i'm friends with john ham and john ham's doing it you're like oh that's actually kind of cool i've never seen him do that but if it's you know if it's your two or three friends who have never really done anything now you have just put the obstacle in the way and made these creative choices where you're limiting how we can put this movie together. Um, but if you've made a choice and said, you know, a, a real kind of conscious creative choice to go, I want this director to do this because of X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, I love this piece of work, or I think that they're going to bring a real vision to it. Um, then that is a, then that's, that's awesome, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and, and if that's the movie you want to make, if that's the person you want to elevate your script and bring it to screen, then phenomenal. 
whether that's with us or with somebody else, um, you've got a strong creative vision and you're making choices based on uh, creative reasons rather than getting the sold reasons. And that's usually yeah. the um, usually the problem. I mean, I think of somebody like Melina Matsukis, this director who uh, just came and just had her first uh, film, Queen and Slim, come out this year, written by um, obviously the phenomenally talented Lena Waite. And, um, but Melina had just, she'd, she'd been in the music video and like I think commercial space, but mostly I knew her for her music videos. She's done a lot of work with Beyonce. And, you know, if, if somebody brought you a package and said, hey, here's this untested first time feature director, Melina Matsukis, but you look at her work and go, oh, look at all of the, um, the amazing stuff that she's done in this space. This is a creative voice that I really want to get behind. Mm -hmm. But I had that, if, if you have that kind of package with a quote unquote first time feature director, mm -hmm. that's interesting. You know, yeah. that's, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. and tons yeah. of people have made that leap that way through music videos to features. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's talk about your um, your television show, Julie and the Phantoms, for Netflix. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. How did you get involved with that project? Um, yeah, I can talk about it as, as much as I can talk about it. Uh, it's still uh, very much under wraps. We just finished shooting uh, less than a month ago. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah, less, just less than a month ago. Um, you know, it's a very kind of cool... Uh, musical TV show for Netflix that is <clears throat> uh, executive produced, excuse me, and a few episodes directed by Kenny Ortega. And Kenny is a legend in the filmed musical theater space, you know, doing things like Newsies and High School Musical and The Descendants films and. You know, he choreographed for Diana Ross and Michael Jackson and oh, nice. did Ferris Bueller's Day Off and choreographed uh, Pretty in Pink and uh, Footloose. Like, he is a, he's a legend who just received his star on the Walk of Fame, huh. an unbelievable huh. talent um, and just a generous soul. So uh, Bright Light became involved because of Kenny. Uh, Sean, my boss, had made... Um, two movies with him had made um, uh, Descendants two and Descendants three with Kenny and and Kenny when uh, wanted to get the band back together. So huh. uh, yeah, uh, I had a, we had a phenomenal time. We spent the back half of last year on that show. Mm -hmm. Actually, and was the show was the show already was the show already set up at Netflix before you guys came on, or was that part of the process? Once you guys came on, you guys got it set up at Netflix. No, the show was set up at Netflix. It was developed um, with Kenny and our showrunners, uh, Dan Cross and Dave Hogue at Netflix. I got you. Perfect, perfect. And when is that coming out? I They haven't given us a date yet. Is that right? Sometime in, 20, sometime in 2020. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, we'll yeah, keep an eye out for just it. Just early, early in the post uh in the post portion of putting this show together. Okay, perfect. So what's next for you? What are you um, working on once um, Joy and the Phantoms is finished? Uh, I've got a feature that I can't really talk about yet that will go in the summer. Uh, and I think that RKSS will be a part of it. Okay. So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most immediate thing. You know, hopefully things go well with Julie and there are further seasons of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. It's a really great show. Um, we've got a couple of other things in the pipe mm -hmm. that are gestating. Perfect. What have you seen recently? I always like to just wrap up the interviews by asking the guests what they've seen recently that they thought was really great. Just something maybe that was a little under the radar. And it can be at the theaters, Netflix, Hulu, anything that's out there um, that people could see. Maybe you saw something recently that you thought deserved a little extra attention. What have I seen recently that's kind of under the radar that I really liked? Um, yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. Sorry. No, <laughs> I don't. I mean, so, I, just I, even I, something that's not under the radar. What's something that you've seen recently that you uh, that you really enjoyed? Succession. Okay. Uh, 
I, was, I got really into Succession on HBO. Um, I I really enjoyed um, Greta Gerwig's Little Women. Okay. Uh, Ford v Ferrari was great. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. And those are all films actually I haven't seen. So, um, so I will, I will dig into some of those. Um, what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Oh yeah, totally. Bright, uh, the brightlightpictures.com, our website is regularly updated with what's going on. Oh, perfect. Um, IMDB is also a great spot. I have Twitter. <laughs> I don't use it as much as I should. Um, and that's that's really about all of the um, internet, social media, e places that you can find me. Okay, well, perfect, perfect. Well, Jameson, I really appreciate your taking time out of your day to talk with me. Um, good luck with um, Julia and the Phantoms and um, all your other other projects. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. Hey, thank you. We'll talk to you later. Talk soon. Bye. I just want to talk quickly about SYS Select. It's a service for screenwriters to help them sell their screenplays and get writing assignments. The first part of the service is the SYS Select screenplay database. Screenwriters upload their screenplays along with a logline, synopsis, and other pertinent information like budget and genre, and then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays they want to produce. Dozens of producers are in the system looking for screenplays right now. There have been a number of success stories come out of the service. You can find out about all the SYS Select successes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. Also on SYS podcast, podcast episode 222, I talk with Steve Deering, who was the first official success story to come out of the SYS Select database. When you join SYS Select, you get access to the Screenplay Database along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members. These services include the newsletter. This monthly newsletter goes out to a list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in this monthly newsletter. We also provide screenwriting leads. We have partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads services so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These leads run the gamut. There's producers looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. They're looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots, all types of properties. Projects. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. Also, you get access to the SYS Select forum where we will help you with your logline and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. We also have a number of screenwriting classes that are recorded and available in the SYS Select forum. These classes, these are all the classes that I've done over the years, so you'll have access to those whenever you want once you join. The classes cover every part of writing your screenplay from concept to outlining to the first act, second act, third act, as well as other topics like writing short films and pitching your projects in person. Once again, if this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that is sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Just one more quick plug for the Rideshare Killer Kickstarter campaign. Again, if you have any interest in contributing or just learning more about it or watching the video, just go to the rideshare and that will forward you to the Kickstarter page. That's the show. Thank you for listening.